David, you're good to start. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who is taking part in this session in whatever part of the world. Um, you're very, very welcome to this technical working group on diaspora human capital. People with lots of valuable experience and expertise uh, will be joining this session, and we look forward very much to a, a lively discussion and to what I'm sure will be very interesting presentations to, to begin with. I hope that out of this session, we can contribute some ambitious and forward-looking ideas uh, which will make a significant contribution to the outcome of the Global Diaspora Summit. Um, my name is David Donoghue. I am a former Irish ambassador to the UN. Uh, I had an involvement in the negotiation of the Sustainable Development Goals. I was one of the two co-chairmen, and I was responsible for putting uh, a positive reference to migration into the uh, SDGs and the 2030 Agenda. I then had a similar role relating to the so-called New York Declaration on Migrants and Refugees, which uh, mentioned in passing the role of diaspora organizations uh, in support of the interests of, of migrants. Um, and now I'm in, involved in civil society, working with a number of academic networks on issues around migration and indeed refugees and the role of diaspora organizations. Uh, with that, let us begin the session. Uh, a few house rules to begin with. All microphones should stay muted apart from the person speaking. Uh, and I would ask you please to respect the, the time limits so that we can get the maximum participation and we'll be keeping a careful eye on that. There are a number of features on the Zoom platform with which most of you are probably already familiar, but you'll see them at the bottom of the screen, uh, the chat function in particular, and also reactions. Uh, if you press that, you'll see the raise the hand function, which uh, will be useful uh, during the event. And when I let you in, remember to unmute yourself. It would be useful, by the way, if you could identify where you're from or your organization simply by, by adding something brief to the name that you have um, uh, that we can see on the screen. So what you do is you go to the more function, which is at the bottom of the screen, uh, and you hit rename, and then you might put in, for example, John Smith NGO, something like that. It just would be, I mean, it's not, it's not vital, but it would be useful for the discussion afterwards. It enables us to recognize, broadly speaking, uh, who you would be representing. Um, finally, then, uh, English, of course, is the language we're using, but there's interpretation available uh, uh, into Spanish or French. And again, you can see the interpretation feature at the bottom of the screen. So turning to the event itself, what we want to do here, of course, is focus on uh, diaspora human capital. That's the particular interest of this session. So what do we mean by this? We mean the resources available to a country in terms of the skills, knowledge, and experience which members of its diaspora communities living abroad have, and the, the contribution which these resources can make both to the country of origin and indeed to the country of residence. Incidentally, it's not, not purely a country, it could be a smaller unit. We, we, we use the word diaspora in relation to regions or cities as well. We want to look at issues such as the knowledge transfers, which can take place between the diaspora abroad and the home country or the, the country of origin, and how these can be of benefit both to the country uh, of origin and to that of residence. We want to examine how the, the skills possessed by members of a diaspora can be identified, can be identified first of all, mapped as it were, and then harnessed for the benefit of the home country and again the, the country of residence. We want to see how the experience they have gained in employment in the country of residence can be turned into benefits of various kinds for the country of origin. We want to hear what are the best practices that you may have come across, what lessons you've learned which can be of value 
for the rest of us, and in particular for policymakers and practitioners. We've been asked to look at three key questions, which are the following. Number one, what recommendations can be made at the policy level to achieve global collaboration in relation to diaspora human capital? Number two, what recommendations can be made for programs to engage and to mobilize this human capital? And number three, who are the key actors who should partner with governments in order to increase this engagement, to deepen it? And how can we support such partnerships? So I would invite you to think about what the right policies should be and are there particular institutional mechanisms we should be looking at. For example, diaspora ministries uh, in, in the country of origin or dedicated focal points for diasporas, that sort of thing. How can we generate a whole of government approach to the challenge of mobilizing uh, the diasporas? How can we improve the quantity and quality of the data we have relating to diasporas? What communication strategies are needed to reach out to diaspora communities and to involve them? And should we design specific initiatives, programs to develop the potential contribution that diasporas can make? Should we be looking at international partnerships of some kind to strengthen the diaspora engagement? We really want to hear your expertise, your insights, your experiences uh, on, on these questions and any others that you think are relevant to the, the topic we're discussing. So let me turn now to the government host country for this session, which is the Philippines. The Philippines is represented by Christine Sale, who is uh, executive director from the office of the, of the uh, let me just get it right, Christine, of the uh, secretary, uh, of the Under Secretary for Migrant Workers at the Foreign Ministry in the Philippines. Uh, Christine will speak to us for about 10 minutes, after which an IOM representative, Roberta Cancel, will present a background paper for this session. We'll then hear three presentations uh, arising from regional consultations which have been held in different parts of the world in the run up to this summit. And then we'll have about an hour for a general discussion, and I look forward to hearing your comments and indeed questions, queries uh, at that point. I begin with the government host country. Christine, you have the floor. Thank you, David, and the Secure Delegates, Partners in Migration, good evening from Manila, uh, good morning and good afternoon to, from wherever you are now. Uh, the Philippines is honored to be the session host of the Technical Working Group on Human Capital, and we would like to thank the International Organization for Migration for inviting us to be a part of this important dialogue and to share our country experience in this discussion. Um, this century has been called the century of human mobility and migration. According to the IOM's Migration Data Portal, there are now 230.6 million international migrants as of mid-2020. This comprised 3.6% of the total world population for that year. Although a vast majority of people still live in countries where they were born, it cannot be denied that there are billions of us that are impacted by these migrants whose human mobility is even expected to increase. In fact, according to the IOM, it is predicted that there will be 405 million migrants in 20, by 2050. Therefore, it seems that there is no stopping migration. It is inevitable and even necessary. And all we can do as stakeholders would be to manage them for the well-being of our societies and communities. The increasing recognition of links between diaspora engagements and development has been preva prevalent in the recent years as emphasized in the, rec um, in the recommendations made in the 2013 Diaspora Ministerial Con Conference. This conference was convened at a time when governments were seeking avenues to increase collaboration with diaspora communities, ultimately realizing their role in society and aiming to maximize their potential by first, recognizing that diasporas can build bridges between states and between societies and calling for this design of local and global strategies aimed 
at harnessing this potential. Second, stressing that communication and outreach are key to the design and implementation of policies and programs relevant to diaspora engagement. Third, highlighting the importance of an enabling environment in both countries of origin and destination to maximize the potential of diaspora engagement. Fourth, stressing the importance of strategic partnerships between states, international organizations, civil society, and private sector to create a framework for diaspora engagement and thereby empower them to share and transfer their resources. And fifth, recognizing that the diaspora can play a role in crisis situations, both during and after the crisis. There is certainly no single global approach to diaspora engagement. To make sure that everyone benefits from it, we can adhere to the strategy of engaging, enabling, and empowering diasporas or the three E's, which was developed by the IOM as an approach to widen possibilities offered to diaspora communities um, in development processes. These three E's serve as a recurring framework to understand the role of stakeholders in diaspora engagement. Each one of us can enable our diasporas to reach their full development potential that effectively engage them and empower them to make a difference in the countries they come from and the countries they live in. As diasporas contribute to society, the resources that they can mobilize are similar to the resources that anyone can mobilize, except for the fact that they can be mobilized in the way that links directly or indirectly to two or more countries. The IOM categorize these resources or capitals as human, uh, social, economic, and cultural. For us here in the, uh, in the human capital group, human capital in diaspora engagements are understood in the sense of human resources. It encompasses a variety of aspects that is country specific. The specificity of diaspora's human capital is that at least potentially it circulates. There is a circulation of skills and there is knowledge transfer that are forms of um, engagement that benefit global development. Members may be workers who contribute to the economy and competitiveness of the country where they live in, and who may at the same time also engage in development processes in their country of origin. Both lower and highly skilled workers have an important role within the social economic fabric of the country where they reside. Similarly, when they return even temporarily to their countries of origin, they bring with them the experience they have acquired abroad. This is equally important during this COVID-19 pandemic when mobility was deeply affected and migrants were put in vulnerable situations. Many migrants found themselves stranded in countries of destination and many have also returned to their home countries due to employment cutbacks. The contributions of diasporas in an era of disruption are starting to be discussed and cultivated as we live through this global health crisis. An effective human capital diaspora engagement is one that considers scenarios in both countries of origin and destination, and one that coexists with each of its capacities. Therefore, the role of governments and stakeholders in facilitating human capital improvements should be articulated so efforts are made to utilize their potential. Moving forward, this discussion can propel states to initiate their own efforts and understanding to diaspora engagement focus on investing human resources. With adoption of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, or the GCM, there is renewed uh, recognition of diaspora engagements as articulated in its Objective 19. Today's group discussion can help us locate our current efforts as we head towards the International Migration Review Forum this May. Being a migrant sending country, the Philippines is home to over 10 million overseas Filipinos all over the world. This has driven the Philippine government to develop a migration governance framework and establish institution, institutions to serve Filipino migrants in their communities abroad. These lessons learned from decades worth of experience enable the Philippines to become a GCM champion country, inevitably supporting in all aspects the adoption and implementation of the GCM. Our Filipino workers overseas have since been an important sector to the Philippines, with the remittances contributing 9.3% of the country's GDP and 7.8% of GNP. 
Thus, the government has several laws and services that provide protection to Filipino migrants in all stages of migration, from pre-departure, on-site, and return and reintegration. Active involvement of local civil society organizations is also vital for collaborations to promote their rights. Instrumental in advancing human capital contributions of the Filipino diaspora is the signing of Republic Act Number no. 11641, creating the Department of Migrant Workers, or DMW, which aims to protect the rights and promote the welfare of overseas Filipino workers. This act took effect last February 3 of this year. It is a groundbreaking achievement for the GCM implementation as it makes the Philippines the first country in the world to include in its law the progressive realization of the 23 objectives of the GCM. It is a step forward towards achieving our aspiration of making overseas employment a choice and not a necessity. The DMW was created to specifically address the issues and concerns of Filipino migrant workers, as it will integrate all services offered by merged government offices and provide cohesion to existing policies, serving as a single destination for our overseas Filipino workers in checking available overseas jobs, processing and issuance of overseas employment certificates, legal assistance for cases, repatriation, reintegration, and other necessary assistance. We believe that the creation of this new department will now give our migrant workers a greater voice and representation in the government, even at the cabinet level with a designated secretary of migrant workers and with presence at the local and provincial levels. Finally, another milestone for the Philippine government is the incorporation of the GCM in the Philippine Development Plan or PDP the country's blueprint for national development. A new chapter 21 was created entitled Protecting the Rights, Promoting the Welfare, and Expanding Opportunities for Overseas Filipinos. The creation of this standalone chapter on international migration is essential as the PDP is the government's overall framework in development planning, which guides national and local government bodies in formulating their programs, projects, and strategies. It also serves as the national implementation of the GCM and aims to ensure the safety and protection of both Filipino migrant overseas and foreign nationals sojourned in the Philippines as they contribute to sustainable development. This is a testament to the Philippine government's commitment to the whole of government and whole of society approaches in achieving the GCM objectives. It is very clear that diaspora engagement has been the core of, of the Philippines' migration governance. We are proud of the initiatives we have done because we believe in our diaspora's potential in nation building, which will help our country to also achieve its GCM object objectives. Therefore, the outcomes from the regional consultation and diaspora engagement conducted last week are imperative in the cultivation of these discussions as the continued cooperation and effective diaspora engagement, especially in mobilizing human capital is envisioned as the role of diasporas continue to increase over time. I wish you a very interesting discussion and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christine. It was very, very interesting and very, very helpful, a very good start to our, to our session. Thanks a lot. I now call on uh, Roberta Cancel of the IOM to present the background paper for the session that I referred to earlier. Roberto, over to you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, we'll be just looking to share my screen. One second. Can you confirm that uh, you can all see my presentation? There it is, yeah. Oh, no. yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, dear participants, for, for this opportunity to share with you um, the background paper that we developed for the technical working group. I've shared the link uh, also in the chat for those of you that didn't get the opportunity to read it ahead of time. Basically, we've tried to compile <clears throat> experiences and, and case studies from around the world that help to uh, illustrate some of the potentials and possibilities um, for engaging with uh, desperate human capital. Just to uh, reflect the framework that we're, we're working in is, of course, Objective 19 of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. And when we look at the commitments they're under, there are several that actually touch on the topic of 
uh, human capital. Um, but I share perhaps the, the most uh, direct reference, uh, which is the sub point J, which speaks to building partnerships between local authorities, local communities, the private sector, diasporas, hometown associations, and migrant organizations to promote knowledge and skills transfer between their countries of origin and countries of destination. Uh, so we can see this directly speaks to the transfer of knowledge and skills as human capital from uh, through diaspora communities from uh, countries of destination uh, or between countries of destination and origin. Um, just quickly, to make sure we're all on the same page, when we speak about human capital in this context, we define it as skills, knowledge and experience possessed by an individual or population viewed in terms of their value or cost to an organization or country or community, uh, just to add that last point. Um, so following the structure of the background document, we'll first look at human, diaspora human capital in terms of countries of origin. And one of the first key areas discussed in the paper is what is referred to as research and development or the collection and analysis of data uh, about the diaspora communities we want to engage with. Um, in IOM's uh, diaspora handbook, which we developed with the Migration Policy Institute back in 2012, we referred to this step as knowing your diaspora. In specific, uh, the background document refers to three key questions. Who is your diaspora? Where is your diaspora? And what is your diaspora doing? Uh, it gives you different uh, breakdowns on each one of those in terms of defining the target audience, defining the countries and localities, and also understanding what are the skills and capacities and propensities to engage of this, com of this population. Some of the challenges identified are the accessibility of existing data, which for countries of origin are sometimes out of reach because they're um, collected and analyzed generally by countries of destination through census um, or household surveys. Um, other challenges are overcoming uh, issues of trust or incentivizing participation of diaspora populations in data collection tools. So if new tools are being developed, how do we get people to actually engage and respond to those? Um, some of the uh, new ways to actually uh, move forward to data collection analysis um, is through using new technology. And we share the case study of skills mapping through uh, big data used by, their, uh, by Armenia to map its diaspora in the United States uh, and in France. Um, it used a mixture of analysis, analysis of website traffic and onomastics or applied, uh, applied onomastics, which looks at identifying people whose names uh, are of Armenian origin within different databases uh, like LinkedIn or university databases um, that would then also uh, fulfill the skills gap that is needed in the country of origin. Another example um, is data collection through collaboration with academia, and we share the case study of the Harvard Growth Lab study on the Albanian community in the United States. Um, this study was done in collaboration between Harvard uh, University, as you can imagine, and also the Open Societies Institute. Um, and this is one example of several different communities uh, that they, were, they collaborated on to be able to identify uh, the general characteristics of these diaspora communities. Um, finally, I want to share one of the tools that IOM has developed. Um, it's also referenced in the uh, background document, which is a diaspora mapping toolkit. It includes a step-by-step -step how to guide for diaspora mapping, um, as well as very concrete uh, indicators, questions, and tools. Um, for facilitating diaspora mapping in a standard and uh, unified approach. It includes a core module of uh, indicators, which should be included in all diaspora mappings to ensure a basic level of understanding of the characteristics of the community, and as well as uh, objective-specific modules that look at the different capitals that we're, we're discussing in general. So there's one specific for human capital, as well as economic, social, and cultural capital that can be used um, depending on what is the overall objective of the mapping exercise. And there's also method-specific modules looking at secondary data, 
quantitative data and qualitative data and how those different indicators can be translated into those different data co collection approaches. Um, this is currently being finalized in English and we hope to have a Spanish version out quite soon. Um, the idea being that we'd be able to then not only uh, have data about one diaspora community at a time, but to have comparable data between countries to be able to do analysis at regional or even global levels and understand megatrends um, in diaspora engagement. So another thing that the paper looks at is the uh, segmentation of diaspora and sectorial engagement. Um, basically, the first comment uh, is looking at how within uh, government we share data and share information so that uh, engagement can be targeted more specifically to the specific motivations and expectations of diaspora communities. So being able to have a common and un united picture of what these communities are like and what they can offer um, is very important. Then in terms of the uh, case study, we uh, share IOM's Connecting Diaspora for Development, which is a program that's been going on for several years based out of the Netherlands, supporting diaspora professionals. Uh, to return um, either temporarily or even virtually to their country of origin to provide uh, their human capital and expertise to fill gaps that have been identified in specific sectors in their country of origin. Um, diaspora knowledge transfer is another key topic. And here, um, the first point addressed is the role of government, either as implementer versus facilitator, and a case study is provided for each. Um, in the first case study of the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program, the government uh, was a facilitator working with um, the, the Carnegie Foundation um, to facilitate the program. In the second case study, the RAICES program, um, led by the, the Argentine government, uh, the government directly implemented this program, which has been going on for several years, engaging scientists and academics from around the world of Argentine origin. Um, then we look at different levels of intervention that can be done through diaspora knowledge transfer, direct assistance, for example, the case of doctors coming back to address specific needs uh, where there's no lo local capacity. Uh, then there's capacity development, where using the same example, doctors would come and actually build the capacity of local physicians to address that need. And then finally, uh, policy development, where, again, using the same example, uh, physicians from the diaspora might come to help develop the um, health policy in a locality uh, or for the national government of origin. Finally, we look at mentorship and going digital. Uh, mentorship allows uh, diaspora members to be more engaged in supporting emerging leaders and change makers. And the case study for that is the Global Welsh Academy, My Mentor, uh, the Global Welsh, Welsh Academy's program, My Mentor. Um, and then when we talk about going digital, one of the things you have to uh, ensure uh, is to avoid the challenge that going digital doesn't mean only digital. And we have to ensure that those that do not have access to um, internet or online platforms are not left or excluded from processes. And there are new tools and opportunities uh, for collaboration uh, for governments with entrepreneurs and innovators. And here we give the case study of Localized, which is an online platform uh, developed by a startup that facilitates the engagement of diaspora professionals um, for mentorship and uh, knowledge transfer. A few preliminary reflections for countries of origin. Um, it's important to establish government frameworks. Um, the government framework should be embedded uh, with external supporters, including diaspora leaders. Um, the engagement should align activities with diaspora self-interest. The phase of human capital asks for diaspora and, um, to phase the ask, sorry, for diaspora capital from diaspora, utilizing existing models and centralizing technology for diaspora capital. Moving on to uh, countries of residence, there are different forms of diaspora communities that we must keep in, uh, keep in mind, recent migrants, as well as generation stick communities. And one way of facilitating this is uh, talent 
partnerships, for example, the case of the Pacific Australian Labour Mobility Scheme. And uh, one of the large great potentials for diaspora human capital for countries of uh, residents is market intelligence, allowing to facilitate the competitiveness of countries of residents in the international market, case study being insights by experts. And another um, aspect is diaspora diplomacy, where diaspora can help advance nation brand value creation. An example of that is the mid mid Mida FinSum program supported by the government of Finland. Um, preliminary reflections ensuring access to participation for diaspora capital and key agencies, mainstreaming diaspora engagement for into appropriate domestic and foreign policy portfolios, in creating or supporting uh, development of diaspora organizations and networks, uh, advancing strategic communication platforms to illustrate impact, and develop co-created instruments for diaspora to contribute in development of country residents. And finally, a few recommendations at the policy level, diaspora human capital must be mainstreamed across all relevant policy uh, portfolios that can contribute to development. On the programmatic level, uh, diaspora human capital engagement should in the short term uh, be informed and re uh, by replicable models of access while also expanding and uh, engaging exploratory investment to embrace new technologies. In terms of partnership, diaspora human capital engagements should at minimum provide collaboration between institutions and countries of origin and residence, whilst also providing a seat at the governance table for key mm -hmm. external implementation partners and most importantly, including diaspora. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Roberta. That was extremely helpful and that gives us a lot of food for thought about the kind of interventions one, one could imagine, I mean, by, by, by both at the policy and at the institutional level. Um, so I turn now to the um, regional presentations. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we've had a number of regional consultations uh, in, in, in preparation for this summit. Uh, and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, two guests here, uh, Claudia Quevedo, who is the project uh, assistant for IOM in Paraguay, uh, and Yusuf Mohamed Mubarak, who's program co coordinator at the Finland Somalia Association. So Claudia will uh, give us an account, first of all, of the Latin American consultation, uh, and then uh, she'll be followed by Yusuf, who will uh, report from the Europe, Asia, Pacific perspective on, on a consultation they've had. And then uh, I'll ask Roberto to step in to give us a, a summary of uh, what happened in the African consultation. So first of all, Claudia, over to you. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Now you can see it. Uh, not yet, Claudia. Try again. Not yet. Okay. I can see it from my side. Oh, yeah. yeah, I can see also. All right, then I'm dismissing it. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Uh, now it's gone. So if you can put it back up. <laughs> there it's we okay? go. Now, now we can see it. Uh, okay. Okay. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here today. It's a pleasure for me to present the inputs on the human capital findings emerging from the Latin regional workshops on diaspora held recently in advance of this summit in the framework of the South American Migration Conference and the Regional Migration Conference. In relation to the political considerations for achieving answers in this area, the following challenges and opportunities identified are consular collaboration between different countries, encouraging the incorporation of professionals in various key sectors, and encouraging the recognition of professional qualifications for effective integration and use of these skills. In what regards to programmatic considerations, some of the identified challenges and opportunities are the importance of promoting actions to increase the participation of the diaspora in projects linked to their countries of origin through incentive. 
Also, we have promoting the incorporation of the diaspora into training programs that will strengthen productive capacities and generate programs for the transfer of knowledge and experiences of professionals abroad for sustainable development. In relation to partnerships, actions to achieve responses, in particular key partners and ideas to initiate partnerships, the link with international organizations, civil society, the private sector, universities, collective of people abroad, such as networks of highly, highly trained professionals abroad, is mainly recognized. And finally, highlighting the three main priorities for empowering diaspora, human capital, the following points that were identified are generating programs of transfer of knowledge and experiences of professionals abroad for sustainable development, ensuring consular collaboration between different countries, and finally, promote the diaspora incorporation in training programs to strengthen productive capacities and the incorporation of professionals in various key sectors. With this, uh, I finish my intervention, thanking you for your attention, and I give the floor to our colleague representing the European, Asia, and Pacific region, Yusuf Mohamed Mubarak. He is program coordinator at Finland Somalia Association. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you. Yusuf, over to you. Yes. I think you can see my presentation as well. Yes. Great. Yes, thank you very, uh, very much, everybody. Uh, it was really uh, my pleasure to be part of the working group uh, discussing the importance of the human capital uh, in, a, in a diverse way. Uh, in this specific work group, we have shared our, uh, also our experience from the IOM projects, where I myself, I have been involved over 10 years, in particular in Somaliland and also South Central Somalia. Uh, in that specific project, it has, it has made possible that over 300 uh, expertise of various uh, sectors uh, to, to go back and participate uh, the institutional capacity building and also the development of Somalia and in that part of the world. And that was, uh, to my view also, uh, as a follower of that project and as a partner with the IOM on that specific project, a very successful intervention. And we thank the, uh, the Finnish government and IOM from uh, coordinating that and, and financing. Uh, in short, uh, in terms of the factor of the human capital, when we speak about that, we all know that uh, maybe we, ca we can lose money, but we cannot lo lose the, the human capital. When we have the skills and, and, and the knowledge with us and, and uh, as a diaspora experts go there and, and, and could be uh, uh, as, a, as a expert, experts uh, also uh, building the, the local capacity particularly in the, in the wartime countries like in East Africa and Somalia, and, and take part in the uh, grassroots uh, capacity building and institutional capacity building, uh, provide services in hospitals, in educational sector, uh, in various government uh, institutions and so on. And also the other participants in the work group have been uh, experiencing the same uh, views with what also in, in Somalia uh, the intervention have uh, have have shown all to all of us, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, in, in this the, the mainstreaming have been uh, 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 discussed. Uh, the uh, this enable engage and, and empower all those are also some uh, factors that the human capital is contributing in a, in a significant way and in a significant manner, and also. Uh, uh, the discussion points that we have been uh, uh, raising in the political level, in the programmatic level, uh, programmatic, programmatic, programmatic level, and also in the in the partnership level, these have been our uh, findings and comments. Uh, in this specific work package, uh, work group, we have discussed it in a diverse manner the importance of a human capital factor and the diaspora experts involved, involved projects, knowledge, social and emotion, emotional point of view. 
uh, in the point one, it has been acknowledged that the host countries benefit from the human capital factor of the diaspora expert parties in uh, many ways, and uh, uh, in contribution is via uh, knowledge transfer and also best practices sharing, as, as this has, be, has also been mentioned in the previous uh, presentations. We have also pointed out and underlined that the diaspora experts play a key role in institutional capacity building uh, in the host countries. Point three, we have acknowledged that local actors, local government, government institutions, civil society, local community uh, engagement has also been important in, this, uh, in promoting uh, local development efforts in the hosting countries. And in point four, we have acknowledged that uh, policymaker, policymakers uh, and also the, uh, developing clear guidelines has also been important. And it's, it's important also as a factor. This so that the diaspora experts' contribution is support in best possible manner, the national development plans, goals, and objectives of the hosting countries. It has also been discussed and seen important that in the future also uh, to involve the diaspora ex expertise in livelihoods and climate resilience interventions and, uh, and use uh, in there also diaspora experts' expertise and knowledge. In short, at the policy level, we have seen that what's needed to develop in the future is a clear guidelines and policy documents uh, <coughs> for diaspora contributions and to make that a clear also in the policy level. And in uh, programmatic level uh, to increase collaboration uh, between diaspora and the host host communities uh, to get a better outcome, and so that not to see also that there is a competition between them, but they complement each other, and in the partnership level uh, to increase and enhance digital platforms to gain a better experience and. Uh, make possible matching, better matching and networking also. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank from, you, Yusuf. Very, very, very helpful. Thank you. Now, Roberto, would you uh, present from the uh, African perspective? Yes, of course, David. I'll share a few points I was able to extract from the notes. Um, I don't have a presentation, um, but hopefully the, these will still help inform the discussions. Um, at the policy level, some of the things that were highlighted is uh, that it would be important to have, uh, to ensure that there is an interlocutor department uh, able to uh, put diaspora in policy development within all the countries in Africa, as this is not the case everywhere. Um, it's also mentioned that there are numerous policy frameworks at the national, uh, regional, and local level. Um, but there needs to be more empirical evidence um, to be able to generalize uh, information. Um, it was also mentioned that uh, countries should develop specific diaspora policies. Um, and for example, Nambia, Namibia is working on it as well as Zimbabwe. Uh, and Zambia has a diaspora policy in place since 2019, as mentioned. Um, in terms of challenges on the policy level, uh, brain drain was noted as a major challenge for Africa. Um, specifically, Ghana mentioned being uh, concerned about this topic. Uh, and there, it's also mentioned the need for better data collection mechanisms uh, to be put in place as a, a concern at the policy level. And in terms of opportunities, uh, some examples were provided, for example, uh, the DASP policy in Kenya, which is embedded in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, Zambia has a DASP policy as well and is conducting surveys to collect data. And, um, and in general, it is mentioned as an opportunity. Diaspora should be incorporated not just in local national and national level alone, but also facilitated uh, across the continent. In terms of the program level, uh, it is mentioned the, uh, the proposal for establishing databases and mapping surveys uh, within Africa to identify human capital and diaspora, as well as conducting brainstorming 
uh, seminars at the sub-regional levels. Um, in terms of challenges, funding was highlighted as a major challenge. Um, and in terms of opportunities, uh, as mentioned, twinning arrangements or uh, soft projects on human capital uh, could be supported, for example, for schools or institutions uh, and to support technology acquisition. In terms of key actors um, that were mentioned, uh, government, religious institutions, media, women's groups, youth groups, electoral management bodies, embassies, and missions abroad were all noted, as well as professional associations of diaspora as a potential uh, partner, which could be reached out to. Um, as overall comments, as mentioned, that further research is needed on the needs assessments um, to, inter to obtain empirical evidence uh, for and to have more information to advance in this area. That is all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Roberto. Um, uh, I mean, one of the themes that's coming through quite strongly here, I think, is that uh, diaspora engagement can bring real benefits for countries of origin and countries of residence. So it's really a, a kind of a two-way process. That's one thing that strikes me. Another is the uh, strong emphasis from those regional reports on the role that diasporas can play, indeed must play, in sustainable development. I think that that, that uh, is something of, of increasing importance. And then uh, thirdly, the, the role of data. We need to improve the, the range of data we have, the, the way in which it's collected. We used to need to look at how uh, technology, uh, how, how digital platforms can help us to accelerate and improve the, the uh, amount of data we can get on diasporas and, and the contribution that they make. Um, and I, I, I thought that the, um, there were a number of good ideas there. Uh, I mean, twinning arrangements, for example, individual initiatives uh, at the level of individual uh, stakeholders, so whether it's governments, um, uh, civil society, the private sector, there, uh, there's a lot of scope for initiatives that each can take to strengthen the, 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 the contribution of diasporas. Partnerships of all kinds need to be, need to be developed. Um, so those were among the points which struck me from three really uh, very, very interesting presentations. So that brings us then really to our uh, discussion. Um, uh, we're, we're doing quite well on, on, on timing. I'll just remind people once again of the three basic questions which we were asked to address in this session. The first one is, what recommendations uh, to be made at the policy level uh, to achieve global collaboration on this human capital aspect? Uh, what recommendations can be made for programs uh, to, to engage human capital? And then finally, who should be the, the key actors? In a way, our discussions up to now and those uh, regional presentations have touched on those bases and have, have given us some good pointers there. Before I launch into the discussion proper, I'll just uh, take Charles Senesi, who has uh, raised his hand. Charles, uh, please unmute yourself and intervene. Charles, so I see your hand up. <laughs> You're very welcome. To... Charles, there you are. Yeah. Would you like to intervene? Yeah. Thanks very much. And uh, uh, it's a, been three wonderful presentations. And I know Roberto very well and then the other colleagues. And then it's really very thought provoking. And, and of course, um, I said to Roberto, he will capture the issue of. Um, as mentioned in this presentation. Now, my main issue is the issue of data capturing so that at least we can um, harmonize the process if we can, so that the data we captured um, will be used across so many other areas of interest in terms of what we call um, external validity, which means we all play according to the same level platform so the data could be replicated in many instances. And uh, it should be very interesting, and I like the idea of the diaspora mapping tool 
which Roberto introduced, we are struggling to back up the diaspora. It's, it's come as such an opportune time for lots of the us engaged in diaspora and mapping. I can't wait to have that tool shared with us because I will be going down next week to Sierra Leone. They have called upon the diaspora to help shape the healthcare delivery system. And I've been in the forefront of mapping the diasporas, especially not only in healthcare, but in health support institutions. So it will be something we can use for external validity so that at least we can have standardized data that can be used for implementation purposes. And I'm quite curious, how can we strengthen this data capturing? I think the one aspect of that question has been answered to have this standardized tool. So at least we, we can use it in capturing this data, cut it across all levels of activities. And I'm quite open to more suggestions to how can we actually standardize the data capturing to be used in healthcare delivery, in educational engagement, I want more by clinics with continuous medical prof professional development across the whole of Africa. And I'm very, very interested in diaspora mapping. Also for the home country, how best can we use this, these tools, especially in countries like Switzerland, where I've been for 18 years, where the government engages the diaspora in several levels of fora. And even within dealing with the police, the migrants with the police, we have the Swiss African Forum, where they invite the diaspora and the, uh, the Swiss institutions so that we understand ourselves better. The police, what should you do as a diaspora? When you are, when you are invited by the police, what should you do, what should you not do? And we play football, we mix interculturally. But then we also, they are curious, who are these diaspora people? What skills do they have that we can access, we can harness so that they make our work easier? And back to our home country is even more important. So I think it's, it's a very good approach, uh, Roberto, and wonderful uh, presentation by Yusuf as well. I thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Um, so let's take perhaps the, the first question uh, to begin with, the, the policy issue. Let's try and structure our discussion that way. Are there particular priorities which people would like to see posed uh, in relation to policy? Um, you're very welcome to uh, have the floor. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the chat in case people come in that way, or else just put your hand up use the raise the hand function. Um, so don't be shy, just, and, and, and when you, when I see your hand, I'll give you the floor straight away. Um, okay, well, many people are in fact not using the video, so it's rather hard to, to see. Uh, okay. Um, Roberto, have you picked up any questions yet that, that have come in uh, um, through the chat? Uh, mostly comments, um, and mostly from Dr. Charles, but I, I do see uh, Kevin Brown has his hand up. Okay, Kevin, uh, please unmute yourself and come in. Hi, th thank you, David. Um, I, I missed some of the presentations, um, but I just wanted to, to make some quick comments. Um, on human capital. Um, so I am I sit on the Global Jamaica Diaspora Council and on the council, I also lead the Partnerships Working Group. Um, in terms of di um, diaspora engagement around um, human capital, I think that is the next frontier for all governments. Um, governments have for many years now um, embraced the financial contributions of the diaspora, but in my opinion, they're yet to fully engage with the human capital. And I'll start with this example. Uh, I'm from Jamaica, a very small country, but immigration is quite impactful. Over 80% of tertiary educated Jamaicans leave the country. So, you know, your, your best and your brightest are overseas. And, um, and so, in my opinion, what the government should be doing is when it, when it is creating its national plans, and development plans, the diaspora should be interwoven into these policies. But unfortunately, we're not necessarily seeing that happen. And so in, in my observation is that uh, engagement with Jamaican human capital is incidental. You know, it, it's not planned and it's not, it's not sort of um, ingrained in the government psyche. Um, at all levels. And I think that is that is the big challenge that we're, we're facing, not just in Jamaica, but I think other governments as well have not truly embraced um, the wealth of skills and knowledge that the diaspora could bring 
And 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 I think um, that that's where we need to go next. How do we get governments to do that? Is 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 still a, a huge challenge because there is a trust deficit, and 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 the other problem I would say is political, in that um, most countries the diaspora doesn't have the right to vote. So politicians are focused on voters. They're focused on who is going to keep them in, in office. There are some certain there are certain practical challenges that limit the influence that the diaspora could have as well on policy and what, what matters to, to governments. So, um, but, but I, I hear governments making the right sounds, but the, the mechanisms to engage human capital is still evolving. Two, two very, very good points there, Kevin. Thanks for that. Um, in fact, what's re- there's something that's relevant here is I see a, a comment from Martin Russell of the Networking Institute. Uh, and Martin asks uh, the, very, the very important question, do we think that it's more advantageous to have a sort of a standalone, separate diaspora engagement policy, or should we embed diaspora engagement in existing policy structures? Uh, uh, you know, one can see the arguments in favour of both. I suppose the risk with a standalone policy is that it it becomes a little bit isolated. It's seen as almost an add-on. It's not quite part of central government planning, whereas uh, I think uh, Kevin brought out very, very clearly there the, 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 the problem that in, say, his government or in the Jamaican government, there isn't actually a systematic focus on the, on the, the skills and, and resources that the Jamaican diaspora uh, contributes. So how do you, what's the best way to go about it? Do you have a standalone policy, separate, say, minister for the diaspora or whatever, or do you try to integrate diaspora policies, diaspora-oriented policies across this, the normal uh, education, uh, research, uh, uh, business, etc. portfolios. Uh, what do people think about that? It has to be integrated, David, you know, and, yeah. and that's the point. So, so, for example, Jamaica has very good standalone policies for the diaspora. Jamaica has a national diaspora policy. It's created a framework that governs that, including the Global Jamaica Diaspora Council that I sit on. Uh, the, the government has done well in terms of standalone diaspora policies, right? The, the problem is that when you look across the, the wider government um, framework or landscape, that's the problem. That's where, that's where things aren't necessarily working as fluidly as they, they, they could and should. So, so the diaspora continues to do what the diaspora does best, which is they, they, they give donations, they, they give in kind when the government calls upon them in, in times of crisis or whatever the case may be. But we don't have a, 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 an integrated national plan whereby every policy that the government puts out should include the diaspora's involvement. That's where we want to get to, you know, completely interwoven, completely joined up. Yeah. Uh, Charles. Yeah, um, Kelvin, I very much agree with you. And uh, there should be a stand alone. But there, there should be efforts, not only from the host country, but from us, the diasporans, to make sure that we try to be part of the system so that we are integrated into it. You know, I run more by clinics all over Africa. I take professionals from different specialties down to Africa. And one of the greatest problems is that people lose contact with their home country or continent of origin. And when they go down to help, they don't know where to begin, and they criticize a lot. And then we, there is a gap between us and those you meet home. So we are there to complement their efforts. If you criticize, criticize constructively. So I take my example of what we do as a team. We go down, we align ourselves with the government. No matter what your opinion about the government, they are the custodian of the health or the custodian of the welfare of the people, just like the WHO. So you have to align yourself. You have to respect the local institution. Then you can flow into it. I was not surprised a poor country like Sierra Leone buying my air ticket, taking care of every so I can go and contribute because I'll be going there twice a year. I'm part of the system. I don't see myself as an outsider. So even though the institution is there, we the diaspora, we have to do everything possible to align ourselves with that institution so that you match it respectfully. But if you go, you stand for a distance and criticize, I mean, they take a, a defensive stand. So I think um, that has worked in most of the diaspora people I take back to, no matter which country, Zambia, Kenya, those 35 years, I encourage them, go gradually and be part of the system, understand how it works, 
and constructively criticize them and then merge yourself into it. With that, it augurs for that sense of ownership of what you go with, it augurs for sustainability. It's very crucial. I thank you. Thanks very much, Charles. Um, any other requests for the floor? Um, there's a comment from Youssef in the chat. And yes. There's a hand from Nigeria. Uh, uh, Roger, we'll, we'll take the Nigerian intervention, please. Thank you very much. I just wanted to add my voice to what um, the other speakers have, have stated and say that in Nigeria, we have a comprehensive um, diaspora, um, diaspora policy, which sets out among other objectives, you know, for the government to engage, empower and enable Nigerians abroad to contribute to national development. And we also have a national um, diaspora commission, which supports and complements the work of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and by extension, other embassies and consulates around the world. And for also to have better interaction with um, diasporans, we also have established an annual diaspora investment summit to provide a platform for investors to in interact with potential partners, sponsors, financiers, and, and official regulators. So these are some of the the, the, the things that I can share from our own country perspective that, um, you know, and how we um, work out our own diaspora policy. Thank you. Thank you, Nadam. Can I, can I ask, just for my own interest then, what's the position about uh, political participation for the Nigerian diaspora? To, to what extent can it vote in, 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 in elections? I'm, just, I'm trying to gauge how integrated the diaspora are with... Uh, the, the country of origin? Um, for that, um, there had been discussions to also um, include that, unfortunately, um, to include diaspora voting um, in the electoral um, bill, which was um, um, adopted to be the electoral act. But unfortunately, it didn't pass this time around. But I'm sure that there will still be conversations around that because we have a very large diaspora community with uh, yes. very, very in, in, who are very, very in, important to, to national development and also um, willing to participate in, in this. So the, con the conversations will definitely continue. Yeah, no, no, I can, I can understand that. I mean, as it happens, uh, we in Ireland have a lot of experience of a, a large Irish diaspora. I see Martin Russell there <laughs> nodding. I mean, Ireland's own population at home is tiny compared to the size of the diaspora abroad. But uh, perhaps partly for that reason, we also haven't yet given significant political representation uh, to, uh, to the diaspora. I think it'll come. I think it'll come gradually. Uh, I, I see Yusuf's comment there is, is, is a good one about, um, you know, if you take, for example, climate change, that there is a contribution which the diaspora in, in, in all societies can make to tackling the problems of climate change and resilience. And we need to find way, some way of building in the diaspora's contribution there. I think that's a very interesting point if people wanted to reflect on it. Martin, sorry, you have the floor. Martin Russell. Yeah, th thanks, David. I, I just wanted to kind of maybe unpack a bit as well something that, that uh, Dr. Kevin Brown said, because I think it's important. You know, we, we've seen um, a lot of interest, particularly from countries of origin, about designing diaspora policies. And I think, you know, the step to integrating it across the, the different ministerial portfolios, I think they're, they're not necessarily exclusive to each other. Quite often, the first diaspora mm -hmm. policy can you know, kind of help educate different players across government about the importance of the topic and it can help in terms of the integration process. But I think you said something really important and it's something that we've been learning a lot in our work, working with governments around the world in terms of diaspora engagement is that, you know, <coughs> diasporas, we often say, have time, talent and treasure. And, and the more that we talk to diasporas, they tend to like to engage in that order, <laughs> in the sense of giving their time, their talent and their treasure. You know, and, and quite often in diaspora policies, I think Kevin hinted at it, is that, the, you know, the economic development focus has been, a, has, been, has been the priority one. So I'm just wondering in a sense of, you know, even in designing those policies, whether they're standalone or integrating across, you know, are, are we getting the, the flow of activity right in terms of how we're engaging diasporas from a policy level? And, you know, should human capital come before that economic capital engagement that or do people have reflections on? You know, of course, they'll, they'll connect to each other in different areas in, in the sense of, you know, talent and skills can contribute to its social economic development. But I'm wondering from the diaspora perspective, in terms of designing policies or interventions, is they ask 
more favorable to begin with human capital rather than say economic capital because i think that could be a key lesson from from the technical working group thank you uh, I don't know that's David, very if I could just quickly respond to, to Martin. Um, sorry. Yes. Because okay. I think it's important. Um, the answer is, 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 is yes, Martin, because if you are in a country where uh, 80% of your tertiary educated population is leaving, then, 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 then where are you going to get? Where's your intelligentsia? Jamaica's intelligentsia, Martin, is overseas. Jamaica's intelligentsia is in the diaspora. So if, if as a government, I would see it as a priority to engage that human capital, that's where you're going to get your expertise from, you know, that, so, it, but, but unfortunately, you know, we're still on that journey. We're not there yet in terms of how do you get that, 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 that diaspora to bring back their knowledge and skill sets. Yeah. Um, I, I see requests there from Karen Yasubian. I, I'm guessing you're from Armenia, Karen, are you? You're very welcome. Please take the floor. Hello, David. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm Karin from Armenia. I'm representing the Office of the High Commissioner of Diaspora Affairs. And I would very quickly like to tell you about how we engage with our diaspora and human capital. Um, I relate to a lot of a lot of the things that were said today about, um, about that human capital being in the diaspora, about uh, the diaspora, like the easiest thing for them to be is to provide uh, financial aid. Uh, but we have also contemplated uh, over how we can engage our diaspora um, further. And one of the things that we are now doing is we have the eCourts program, which has been running since 2020. So this is the second year and we're now recruiting for the third year, where we actually bring in diaspora ex um, Armenians from the diaspora um, experts and um, professionals in their own different spheres. And we bring them in to actually work within the Armenian government for a year. Um, during that year, they are able to influence policy, uh, best practices. They bring in their, um, their knowledge and their expertise. Um, and in, we are hoping that through that, we're also um, encouraging professional repatriation. Um, our first year statistics, seeing that was a very, very difficult year for Armenia as well, as internationally, seeing as there was COVID as well, um, actually proved very successful because at the end of uh, the first year, 70% of us, I was also one of those first eCourts participants, um, decided to stay in Armenia. Um, whether they repatriated or not, I think it's still hard to say, but uh, currently, we have a very big number of the first year participants still in Armenia. Uh, some moved to the private sector. Um, others, um, others like me, are still within the public sector. Um, but this has proven to be a very good way as to engage that um, in order to also develop the country's infrastructure. Very interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Um, Roberto, I'll give you the floor. I think Charles had the hand up first. Well, um, sorry, Charles. Yeah. Charles. Thanks a lot. Um, just two short interventions. Um, first of all, I didn't want the question from Yusuf about climate change to get lost. And it's, it's quite crucial that we as a diaspora actually take that as a topic. I'm a physician and a researcher, but I've got a farm in Sierra Leone, about uh, 100 acres where we do tree planting, we do things to support the ecosystem. And uh, these are initiatives we can align also with other great players on the continent who are doing tree planting, also revamping the ecosystem again. I'm not an expert, but I would like that the issue of climate change is really broken down to the simple level of a physician for me to understand how can I contribute. And that the diaspora can do very well. If I can explain to my grandmother in the village what a climate change is, what she can do, plant trees to support the ecosystem, I think we are a long way in that direction. So I really like it to be broken down to that level as well. And back to the issue of who are the key actors in, in, is in the area of, 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 of policy development. I think the government is what? One, that we have to home in upon and also support government, support the institution, as well as the international community, the UN, and when it comes to, the, to health, the WHO, no matter our opinion, they are the custodian of the health of the world. So let's align ourselves with them in terms of policy 
that will actually have a long-term sustainability, including the IOM, which is not a year support institution. Uh, thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Roberto? Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the interventions and comments. Um, I just want to reflect a bit on, on Martin's question or, or comment about you know, whether human capital should be a first step. I, I fully agree. I think it's, it is often the, the easier ask you know, to, for, for people to respond to. But I think the, the way Dr. Kevin responded, I think, was quite important. He, he noted the statistic, right, about the, the percentage of tertiary educated Jamaicans abroad. And I think that that's what's quite important is when we're talking about where governments should intervene, it's actually knowing the specific sectors where there is potential for diaspora engagement. So if you have a large tertiary educated uh, population abroad, then of course, you know, human capital should be a priority. Um, but it shouldn't be your exclusive focus because you are also going to have, you know, day laborers, for example, that, that maybe are, do feel more comfortable just sending, you know, uh, a few dollars to, to, you know, uh, a fund or through crowdfunding. So it's to know what are the different sectors um, in different um, profiles in the diaspora and targeting different interventions that respond to the capabilities um, and the desires of these different sectors. And, and of course, again, the first step of that is just, just having data and, and having good information. Thanks, Roberto. Um, I, Evan Garcia from the Philippines, please, please intervene, Evan. Can you hear me? Uh, there you are. That's great. Yep. I can't switch on my camera. Anyway, I would first of all like to uh, convey uh, our profound appreciation to the government of Ireland for so manfully and uh, womanfully stepping up to the job. <laughs> I have to be careful nowadays. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on what was said by uh, the IOM. It is absolutely important that we understand by data and research, the segmentation of diaspora populations. If we only look at the highly educated, that's one whole universe with its own dynamics. But as was pointed out, there are day laborers, uh, um, domestic workers, a very large population of um, semi-skilled or unskilled, uh, say they would say workers. They are also potentially active contributors on two aspects. One, they can help contribute to the safety and welfare of diaspora populations themselves mm -hmm. in cooperation and partnership with the government. And they could, for example, uh, at the level of their home village or hometown, provide certain inputs to support development there. Maybe not in terms of a lot of money, but in terms of um, getting information back to the uh, the hometown. So it's important to segment or have an understanding of the nature of uh, diaspora populations because uh, each segment will generate its own dynamic and its own potential. So I hope uh, that contributes somewhat. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Evan. Yeah. Uh, Charles, you had your hand up. <laughs> no, sorry, sorry. I should sorry, put it down. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, David, there's a few comments in the chat. Would you like yes. to share them? Uh, please do, Roberto. Yes, I see one here from Melek Pulatkonik uh, mm -hmm. about a model mm -hmm. that they... Yeah, would, would you like to pick out a few? Oh, sure. Uh, I'll start <laughs> with a comment from Elizabeth uh, um, Milling. Um, she's a colleague of uh, Dr. Kevin Brown. Um, on the Global Jamaica Diaspora Council. And she says, we do need to have the diaspora fully integrated into national development policies and involved in the process. I listened with interest to Charles Senesi regarding how Sierra Leone engages diaspora. I work with their community here in England, and it is interesting that their government will always consult their diaspora first for advice then to non-nationals as they are aware that their diaspora have an 
innate knowledge of national issues, inter alia, and a deep national commitment. So thank you, Elizabeth, for that comment. And then from uh, Melek, she is sharing with us uh, the model from an earlier session on mobilizing human capital in digital platforms to support women in the workforce, uh, Turkish Win, uh, which uh, she is the founder, if I'm not mistaken. So thank you, Melek, for that contribution. Um, then there's some additional comments from uh, Youssef. He says, also important factor to notice and underline in the Horn of Africa, um, diaspora returnees are also playing a key role in creating companies, businesses, and employment. I believe the situation is the same also in the other countries. And that's all. No, those, those are very interesting points. Maybe we, we might just focus a little bit now on what kind of um, uh, institutional mechanisms can be devised to uh, help to mobilize the diaspora. I mean, what, what do people think from their different perspectives? Does it make sense to have, for example, a, a ministry uh, uh, or minister for the diaspora? Or uh, should we, you know, what are the pros and cons of, of uh, creating kind of a standalone institutional capacity? Does it work, really? I'm just wondering whether people from a governmental perspective can ha have more to share there. I mean, we heard from, from Christine earlier about um, what the Philippines are doing. Are, are there others uh, on this session who have uh, a background in government who might be able to give us their, their views and insights on that? Okay, or even people, let's say, from a non-governmental per perspective, do you see, uh, oh, sorry, here's um, Aida Garcia from Peru. Please, you have the floor. Muy buenos días. Eh, buenas tardes a todos. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. In the case of Peru, at the General Directorate for uh, Peruvian Communities Abroad in the Foreign Affairs Ministry of Peru, we do a follow-up of the communities that we have abroad. In the case of Peru, we have approximately 3 million Peruvians around the world. That means that 10% of our population lives abroad. Now, we've seen uh, some minutes ago, someone said that there was a segmentation of these diaspora population, and it is really difficult to communicate and to reach all of them. First of all, we carry out uh, a survey. We are now doing our second world survey among the Peruvian communities abroad. We've seen that it is really difficult to reach to a minimum sampling amount so that this survey is valid from a statistical perspective for it to be relevant. So this uh, issue that David is mentioning is really important. How do we communicate, how we can reach a community that is living in different realities all over the world and in each country, they are going to have different uh, features. They will have different levels of inclusion in the hosting country, also different links with the country of origin. It's really difficult. We try to do it through these surveys, but uh, again, it's a really difficult exercise. It's really difficult to reach these people. As a country that traditionally was uh, an emigrating country, we have many consulates all over the world, 
a great network of consulates and also cultural programs in order to keep this link with Peruvians abroad. But the reality is <coughs> not all Peruvians living abroad are going to have the same closeness or relation with the government. So for us, it was quite interesting. We wanted to hear about any experience that uh, others, other countries could share. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aida. No, th that's, that's a, a very interesting point. Um, uh, I mean, I imagine that it must be the same for many countries, that the, the diaspora is so varied. You can have people who've just emigrated last year or last week, and you have others who have been Uh, 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 who never perhaps lived in the country, but who are of Peruvian descent. Uh, and you have lots of different socioeconomic uh, uh, backgrounds. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I relate that very much to the Irish experience. I can think of, you know, young, relatively well-heeled Irish people who have emigrated to Australia last week. And there might be Uh, um, people in in Britain who are uh, who of Irish descent but have a, quite a different socioeconomic background and really it, it, the diaspora is very diversified and it must be I imagine the same for many countries which just adds to the challenge of uh, trying to understand how you can mobilize the uh, how you can engage the diaspora better uh, in the life of the of the country of origin anyway. Um, Has anybody else, uh, uh, Charles, sorry, would you like to come in again or is that still from the last time? No, no, sorry, that's a very interesting. You're point. welcome at any point. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'll be leaving soon. But anyway, it's quite an interesting discussion. And uh, in terms of, there's no fixed answer to how could we integrate the diaspora, either as a single institution or integrated, maybe a midway point. I take the example of Sierra Leone again. The office of the diaspora was located in the office of the president in, to just give it a high level. It was a unit. Now it is being upgraded to a full directorate with a lot of staff. It has evolved over the years. Where maybe out of its humanitarian or crisis, lots of the diaspora, like most of us, we raise resources, human material and financial, be it the Ebola, be it the COVID, be it the mudslides, be it the petrol tank. So we are always on the forefront. So we put ourselves in a position where they say, hey, let's get these people in a better coordinated fashion so that at least they can give their input in a more coordinated way. And that's what gave rise to the Office of Diaspora in the Ministry of Health recently, which I'm going to go to support and bring other people on board. Even in the host country in Switzerland as well, the, the diaspora has been slowly institutionalized. In Switzerland, we have the African Diaspora Council which is meant to bring all the diaspora organizations so that we can meaningfully engage the government. And I spoke about the Swiss African Forum, wherein we've made a group of think tankers institutionalize it so we can engage the government in diaspora-specific problems. We know our problems. We can relate better. We can tell our stories better. So I can see that slowly getting a diaspora group institutionalized will be a, a better coordinated way of service delivery, be it in agriculture, health, in whatever field. I limit myself to agriculture and health is what I know best. <laughs> I don't know about the other <laughs> economic or but slowly I run a network where I bring all professionals in different points of politics, finance, engineering, and we all work together in, in, the, in the coordinated fashion in, 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 in German, um, in brackets. So, so that's where I think there's no fixed answer to that, but let's try different models until we get there. But the good news is that if we are all driven by one passion to help, by one vision, All our differences will align themselves. I uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Uh, Kevin, would you like to come back? Uh, yes. Uh, to thank, thank you, David. I I appreciate, I appreciate that there might be some complexity, and of course, you have to look at diaspora as, as various segments. Um, but I guess what would be helpful, and certainly, uh, Dr. Charles gave a the good example of Sierra Leone is that if governments made integration of the diaspora in national development an ideological position, we would see a paradigm shift. Because if it was an ideological position that the diaspora is, 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 is literally um, not a separate entity or a group of people, but actually um, you know, uh, very, 
much so part of the, the nation, then, then, then every policy, every policy, every, every uh, even legislation would, would look at how is, it, how is the diaspora uh, going to be impacted and how can they be included? And if we get to that stage, then, um, you know, it, it would definitely, I think, certainly for small island states like Jamaica, be very impactful. Because just imagine, you know, you, you, in Jamaica's case, you've got uh, almost three million more people whose talents you can tap into, whose talents you can call on, whose talents will be there, um, not just incidentally, but would have been deliberately interwoven into everything the government does. Because unfortunately, David, what happens is that what we're observing sometimes is that when Jamaica needs expert help, it calls upon non-nationals. And in part, sometimes this is fueled by the donors, right? So we, have, we can't ignore that, that other challenge where donors insist on who is going to be uh, the expert in the room. But, 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 but what we're saying is that uh, these experts sometimes, uh, um, you know, uh, that are non-nationals, actually you could find them in the diaspora, you know, but, but this is, we just don't have that mechanism to, to, to make sure that they're there and, and that, uh, you know, so I, I, I hope that going forward, you know, governments will take a more ideological position that the diaspora is definitely a sort of one nation approach. No, you, you, you raise a very interesting point there, Kevin. Um, I wonder whether uh, colleagues uh, are aware of, um, let's say, national constitutions around the world which make explicit reference to the diaspora. Uh, it's just from something you, you said there, I was, I was reminded that in Ireland, we took an opportunity about 25 years ago to put in an explicit reference to the diaspora. Uh, I think we, we, we didn't quite use that word, but we... we, we brought out explicitly that they are part of the Irish nation. Uh, and I think that, that it would be an interesting initiative or it, it would be something which is worth considering if countries haven't already done it. We did it deliberately to, to make that point. And uh, uh, so maybe if people had uh, reflections on that, it might be of interest. Um, okay, are there any more uh, requests for the floor? Roberto, is that you from a previous, your hand is up at the moment. No, that's that's a new one. You're very uh, welcome. Um, thank you, David. Uh, I just wanted to actually comment briefly on uh, what was mentioned by uh, Ida from Peru um, on because I think it is one of the the, the comments that we had in the background paper, um, specifically how to reach and incentivize um, members of diaspora to participate in data collection and analysis um, processes. And one of the things that, that we have um, looked into in, in several different uh, circumstances is um, basically frameworks for incentives. So, for example, many countries provide um, diaspora ID cards that, for example, facilitate um, entry or exit into the country or um, expedite administrative procedures such as getting your birth certificates, marriage certificates, things that, you know, often are, are challenging and, and trying for members of diaspora. So there are little things with very um, small financial impact for the government, but can actually, you know, help facilitate people's lives and provide them, you know, a reason to register with the government as a member of diaspora, so that's just one of the one of the many ways that you know this this challenge can be addressed that we've seen around the world, um, and we've seen works uh, in many different situations. I also see there's a comment from Zara Uman, which is in French, and unfortunately my French is not <laughs> up to uh, translating. Um, perhaps we yeah, can pass for the word. I see it. Uh, someone calls up. Um, uh, Sarah would like to know um, uh, what should a government do to um, give give confidence to its diaspora, uh, so as to get it to contribute actively in the in the development of the the country of origin. Yeah. So how do you build? I suppose how do you, in a way, it's what you were just saying about how do you incentivize? How do you how do you motivate uh, the diaspora to 
be active in its contribution. Um, uh, Martin, you, you asked for the floor. Yeah, just, just quickly on that, David, because I think you raise a great point about, you know, how do we institutionalise this in government? And I think, you know, a lot of what we're talking about so far, just the nature of the group is obviously very technical, but you mentioned the the, the constitution. I think, you know, the level or the importance of high level political leadership in this is incredibly important. You know, I think diaspora engagement has to be signposted from the highest offices as being a key developmental policy of choice, both domestically in terms of domestic policy, but also foreign policy. And I think that's that's something that quite often gets a little bit kind of hidden in this process. So I just wanted to flag that because, I, you know, I think coming to the technical level, then at the institutional building, having been involved in the development of different policies, the, the first battle you have is that diaspora engagement can cut across about 15 different ministries. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and trying to get that to peacefully coexist is a, is a labour of love. You know, I had a full head of hair when I began this work. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's a, I think it's important that we, we kind of work through that. And I, I think a, a question that I think fascinates me, particularly from the summit, is that, you know, we're seeing more and more governments begin to talk to each other either through bilateral processes or regional processes on this topic. I'm just wondering, you know, because we do have these different options in terms of institutional setup, you know, programs and different types of partnerships. How important do colleagues feel that increasing that level of government to government discussion as well, you know, between governments that are interested in this topic kind of moving forward? Thanks very much, Martin. Indeed. Um, and I see a, a comment here from Christine uh, about the the Commission on Filipinos Overseas, which is a government agency in the Philippines. It, so, it sounds very useful. I wonder, um, Christine, can I bring you in on that? Could you just tell us what kind of a budget it has, what sort of stuff, what are its, its exact functions? Yes, uh, thank you, David. Yes. Um, well, I cannot really um, say exactly the budget, but as I shared in the chat group, the website, people can take a look at it. And you could yeah. see there that there are many programs um, uh, on the Filipino diaspora from the time we uh, from the time of pre-departure on site and even for the return and reintegration of our Filipino uh, migrants. Um, so uh, basically, uh, from uh, like for example, pre-departure, we have a pre-departure orientation seminar for them before they leave yeah. the country, and. When they return, um, there are several programs um, depending on on the profession that they have. Because, uh, for example, we have the Balik Scientist, which is the return of a scientist uh, into the Philippines. And we also have the return of teachers, um, uh, many others, even donation. Uh, they also coordinate donation of the F Filipino diaspora abroad, donation to the country. So, because many people, many of the delegates here, participants have talked about how can they um, engage with their diaspora, and I thought I would share that um, link so you could probably see all the programs that the government um, uh, created for our diaspora, and maybe it would even give you ideas. Well, I mean, I think it's uh, extremely interesting, uh, Christine, and even the idea of having pre-departure seminars, that's, uh, <laughs> for me, quite novel. I mean, and, and it's a great idea, and, you know, it reflects acceptance that this is a perfectly normal thing to do, and, 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 and uh, it would probably build connections with the diaspora from the, from the, from the, from the beginning. I mean, we, we tend to think of the diaspora as communities who, so, who somehow grow almost independently of the state, but uh, this way the Filipino government would be keeping in touch with them from the very beginning, before they've even got onto the plane. Uh, that, that, that is very interesting. Yeah. Okay, we're sort of coming gradually towards the end of the, of the discussion, I think, but I'll just check whether there's anybody else who... Uh, 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 Charles, please. That's my last point before I go anyway. <laughs> I yeah, just want to go in of Zara, who wrote in French, if I correctly understood, um, how do you have confidence sort of in the diaspora? How can the diaspora have confidence to be mo motivated? I think one thing we need to have, we need to have local champions. You know, people who the system believes in, who the diaspora believes in, who is being known to champion the causes of humanitarian work, giving free, and trying to be as Clear cut. I don't want to use the word honest. Clear cut in dealings with people. 
And in Sierra Leone, I'm not saying my name, but the founder champion in some of us for 25 years, I've been doing humanitarian work. I had leadership roles in humanitarian work, head of the, of the Medical Dental Association, College of Medicine, my student senior days as president, and lots of humanitarian work. So when you call on people, people like that who are known for pillars of, of humanitarian work, when you make them champions, people listen to them. And it's, it's August, a lot of programs to go, to go smoothly. So that when there is a disaster, I call on my colleagues to donate. We come in, those we donate and we finish the program, we give them a clean account back. So, and when we call upon them to come and volunteer, they don't do it wholeheartedly. So it's my little I mean, pieces of advice would be to look for that particular champion. They, are, they are, exist everywhere. And also everywhere I bring together knowledge sharing I and mean, I mean, a conference at the United Nations. Unfortunately, the, the COVID did not allow us. So we bring in so, so many of these humanitarian. Then you slowly you find your own partner with whom you can rhyme and move along with. It's a matter of trial and error. But by and large, you should be driven by that one vision that it has to what I'm going to contribute to the healthcare delivery system of my continent or country of origin and look for your for your key. I, mean, I, mean, I don't call this role model, people you think you can align with. It. It's not easy to find, but there are people like that. I thank you. I hope that's for Zara. Thank you. Thank you, Jaws. Yeah, I very much agree. Um, would anyone else like to take the floor? Uh, if not, I can I'd probably uh, wrap up the discussion at this stage, if, uh, unless there's anybody who has a particular uh, point they want to make. Uh, okay, well, look, um, thank you to everybody for a very, very rich and, and, and fascinating discussion, I must say. We've covered a, a lot of ground. Um, difficult to, to, to sum it up. Uh, in no particular order, I would uh, pick out um, uh, the point made about um, the, the, uh, the benefits which flow both to the country of origin and to the, the country of residence. Uh, from active involvement of the of the diaspora, that this is uh, it is uh, as it were a two way process, um, and that it must be more fully recognised. Uh, secondly, the uh, direct contribution that's made to sustainable development. I mean, this is a particular hobby horse of mine, having um, um, co chaired the SDG negotiations and the New York Declaration on Migration and Refugees. But I'm very very uh, uh, interested in the in, in the interconnections between migration and sustainable development. So I think it's an angle that we all need to highlight, uh, including at the forthcoming IMRF. Um, I think we, we didn't actually look that much at the humanitarian angle uh, today, but there's no doubt that in the current Ukraine crisis, uh, Ukrainian diaspora organizations are playing a very important role worldwide from what I've been able to, to, to gather. So there's almost kind of a natural expectation that the diaspora will intervene to help its fellow citizens in any situation of, of, of a crisis. And the current one is a particularly good example. Um, the, the, the need to get more data about um, the uh, skills and employment history and and and, and uh, potential uh, um, I, I, in many different sectors. I think that we have there's a challenge there to increase um, the amount of uh, uh, and the quality of data that we have available because that will help governments to uh, draw on the diaspora more actively or to to reach out to the diaspora. Um, uh, uh, in, in, to make up specific labour market shortages and so on um, back in the in the country of of origin, um, there is the the issue of um, what what institutions we need in order to, uh, to 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 improve coordination. I mean, Martin referred to the difficulty of um, uh, promoting diaspora engagement when many different ministries in a country like uh, Ireland are involved in one way or another. Uh, so I'm not quite clear myself on what the best solution is. If you have, uh, um, I mean, there's a clarity in having a, a, one individual ministry for the diaspora. But on the other hand, I, 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 am afraid, I fear that that would end up leaving it a little bit uh, isolated as almost uh, uh, something which is not 
not not integrated. And uh, so I think Martin, you yourself mentioned that you, one doesn't exclude the other; that you can perhaps have have both. Um, and uh, there's the role then of partnerships with civil society, um, uh, the business sector, the universities. Uh, we need to find ways of bringing them into a collective effort uh, in, in support of diaspora engagement um, and the the um, uh, the incentives. I think that was a strong theme. What what kind of incentives can we devise to uh, make it more attractive for members of diasporas to voluntarily contribute? To the 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 as it were the country of origin, the country of residence. We need to make it. We need to help them to be proactive on on that front. Sometimes they might fail to get connected or fail to see connection between themselves and the and and the country of origin. I was particularly struck by the Filipino examples, uh, uh, both the governmental arrangements that. Uh, Christine mentioned, and also the the commission idea um, and, and the the seminars for Filipinos actually uh, emigrating. Um, there were many many other ideas. Mentorship, I thought, was uh, an area with great p potential. Um, uh, all of these in, being incentives that that we can we can develop. Um, what else? The uh, um, the, the, the whole question of, I mean, Kevin, Kevin brought this up, um, how far should governments go to um, recognize that much of their intellectual, their intelligentsia, as, as Kevin put it, are abroad? I mean, that that is, you know, if that's the case, then governments need to be more urgent and more uh, uh, interventionist in, preve in, in preventing a brain drain and, and sort of making it more worthwhile to stay at home. Um, and uh, there is a there's a lot to be considered there. The um, uh, the, the, the question of the, the value placed on the diaspora, I, I floated myself the notion of national constitutions making explicit reference to the diaspora to demonstrate that they are absolutely part of the nation. I, mean, I know that's just a symbolic gesture, but it could, you know it's something which is important if you're trying to demonstrate a, a kind of a, a set of common interests between the diaspora and the and the, the home country. Um, and then finally, maybe the, the 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 discussion we had about the segmentation uh, of the of diasporas, the fact that there are many diverse kinds of uh, migrants uh, um, in socioeconomic terms, in in sort of um, in age terms, those who are, who are very recently gone, those who have been away for generations, those who were ne who never lived in the country of origin, etc. Um, it's a very diverse environment, and it's therefore all the more challenging to find a, a single approach which will work with the uh, entire. Uh, range of diasporas. So look, I'll I, I leave it at that. I thought it was a great discussion and thank you to everybody for participating. I'd now like to hand over for a final word to Christine on behalf of the of the government host country. Thanks, Christine. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, um, it, it was indeed a very interesting and active discussion and I thank all the participants for um, contributing to all these uh, lively discussions that we had. I, I noted two themes uh, during this discussion, which is data, data. we talked a lot about data collection, and as well as getting to know the diaspora. And these two themes actually are connected to each other because you need data to collect data in order to get to know the diaspora. And, um, uh, even in the Philippines, actually, we face challenges in uh, collecting data because we do lack a unified database for migration. And we also have a limited capacity to monitor the welfare of our overseas migrant workers. However, we do recognize that it is needed um, because it is... Uh, it could help in uh, designing um, better uh, policies to respond to our no national, local, and diaspora needs. Um, and in this regard, the, uh, we need to create um, spaces for for um, state uh, diaspora interaction, and um, which really reinforces the the getting to know um, the diaspora and. 
this can be done in um, many activities. Uh, it can be like uh, listening exercises or even trainings that you could provide direct uh, assistance to the, your diaspora communities and even supporting diaspora organizations and networks. Um, new technologies as well, including social media, can also uh, facilitate more um, of this interaction. Um, therefore, I believe that there is um, there is um, a need for government to rethink its role in how to engage with diaspora because uh, most of the time um, there really is a, a, um, a preference towards um, state-centric approaches and really need to listen to our diaspora in order to to be able to um, uh, to be able to um, uh, to be able to engage with them more because uh, otherwise it will just create obstacles and and following this um, the integration of diaspora engagement into institutions and policy frameworks would be really helpful and I have provided you with examples of the Philippines best practices and uh, I mentioned here uh, earlier and even in the chat group of the creation of a new office a de department for migrant workers and even an existing commission on Filipinos overseas, um, which really tries to engage our diaspora. So um, this really helped in um, providing a coherent development plan for the country and which will uh, obviously do dovetail with the national development plan and migration policy of your country. And of course, uh, finally, uh, regarding um, uh, this can uh, definitely help in um, in um, enhancing cooperation on migration through digital transformation. So earlier data collection, we are now um, trying to digitalize all our data collection. And I think that um, countries sh uh, should be able to uh, use this um, platform, digital platform, to take advantage of the digital transformation for the information and processes of engaging with our diaspora. So that's it for me, David. And uh, Great, I Christine. thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Thank you for, 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 for that contribution and the early ones. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you. I, I, I bring the session to a conclusion. I hope you found it interesting. I certainly did. And uh, there will be um, an outcome document from the summit, as you're aware, uh, and there'll also be a report on the proceedings. So um, uh, I wish you every success in, 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 in your various activities uh, in support of um, diasporas. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. Okay, bye-bye.